chapter two of a four chapter book called Ruth that we're using for our Christmas series this year, calling it the Kinsman of the Redeemer, the significance of which you'll uh, hear more about in uh, uh, the message today. But stay in Luke chapter two. We're gonna walk our way back through it um, in just a moment. If you don't personally uh, own a Bible, we've got Bibles in the chairs in front of you. Grab uh, one of them. There are hardback ones you can use today or the paperback ones. Uh, take it with you if you uh, don't personally own a Bible. And uh, if you know of someone who doesn't own one, pass it on. We'd love for them to have access to the word of God. Um, you can flip on an app as well, however you wanna get there. Make sure your eyes are in... Uh, Ruth chapter 2 today. Do you believe in coincidences? Do you believe in coincidences? Uh, there was a pastor, this is a true story, who got on a plane uh, bound for Salt Lake City. And uh, as you do, you sit down if you're alone, and someone's probably sitting next to you, and so you start chatting. And next to him was a mother and her daughter, and um, they were all flying to Salt Lake City. And um, he started asking, you know, about them, and they asked about him. And it turned out, you know, he shared that he was a pastor, and through that was able to share uh, what it's like to be in church ministry, and then able to share the gospel with them. And through the course of the flight, he led this woman and her daughter uh, to faith in Jesus Christ. And then more of the, the woman and her daughter's story started to come out, and it, it turns out that they were uh, flying back to, uh, to the husband uh, to reunite. They, uh, the mother and, and the father had been separated for two years because of the husband's drinking problem, but the woman was going to give it one more shot, and she was returning with her daughter to, to reunite, and she said, man, now that I have this, this, uh, this hope and this faith in Jesus Christ, he could really use that too. Would you mind um, coming with me and meet my husband and, and share with him what you shared with me, and uh, it could really be a, a good way to, to restart our marriage, and uh, the pastor said he would be more than willing to do that, and so they get off the plane, and, and they go and find the husband, and they start chatting, and after a few minutes, it turns out that while this husband was waiting for his wife and daughter to arrive, he was sitting there, and, and who should sit next to him but a missionary who was coming home on furlough, and in the course of events and their discussion, this missionary led this husband to faith in Jesus Christ. Do you believe in coincidences? That at the exact same moment, a pastor and a missionary get on a plane, they just happen to end up sitting next to uh, this mother and this child, and then in the airport, this furloughed missionary waiting for his flight sits next to this, the husband of the same family, and almost at the same moment, both sides of the family are led to Christ and then reunited. Do you believe in coincidences? See, how often do things like this happen in our world and we chalk it up to just mere chance, to, to coincidence. Man, it was lucky that that took place. And you know, when we believe in God and that he's you know, in charge of things and, and we believe in Jesus that he died for our sin and we wanna be a faithful follower of him, you know, we, we tell ourselves that no, we don't believe in coincidences that God's in control. But when it comes right down to it, 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 deep down inside of us, sometimes we do buy into the world's view that things just happen. Sometimes we do believe in the world's point of view that the world is out of control. And things just at random are taking place. It's just chance. But the reality is, that is completely opposite to what Scripture teaches. And Ruth is a prime example of that. Already in the first chapter that we looked at last week, we have seen how God works in the circumstances that happen in our lives. And last week specifically, we looked at how God works through the trials and the suffering and even the discipline that happens in our lives to accomplish his purpose and his good will. Today, we're going to look at how God is working through life circumstances, but in a little different manner. How God works through normal, everyday, ordinary situations. We're going to see how God works out his big picture plan through working out the ordinary details of our lives. And the bottom line of today is this, that God does extraordinary things using ordinary people living their ordinary lives in faithfulness to him. That God does extraordinary things using ordinary people living their ordinary lives in faithfulness to him. So right now, we're going to walk our way back through this chapter. I'm going to point out some things, and then after we get through with that, we're going to uh, make some points of application for each of our lives, some takeaways for us by looking at the, the three main characters in this chapter. But to set the stage, we're going to back up to the last verse of chapter 1. 
The last verse of chapter 1 summarizes what took place in chapter 1. And so let's read verse 22 of Ruth chapter 1. It says this. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. That note at the very end, at the beginning of the barley harvest, is extremely important. This was the first harvest to come in. And one harvest would go into another harvest, and there would be about seven to eight weeks, almost two months of harvesting that would go on, and that harvesting would, would produce the grain that was needed to sustain a, 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 a city or a, an area for an entire year. And it was a prime time for the poor to be able to be provided for. And the way they were provided for was a, an act called gleaning, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But before we see Ruth going about the act of gleaning, we are introduced in verse 1 of chapter 2 to a whole new character. And here we see how um, intricate the, the literary techniques are used in writing this story because we're teased out. Something important is about to happen. We were told that they returned to Bethlehem right at the time of the barley harvest, and then the scene changes, and we're introduced to a new character, Boaz. And here's what it says about him. Now, Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Two specific things here are mentioned about Boaz. First, his clan, the clan of Elimelech. Now, a clan, we don't really have clans today, at least we don't call them that, um, but I think you'll be able to relate. Let's think about it in terms of this. When you gather with your family for a holiday, um, each family is going to have a different amount of people that they're gathering with, depending on how many you know, groups of your family are here around you or who will travel. So like when I get together with my family, generally it's rather small. I only have one sister, she only has one child, my mom and dad are here, and that's about it. Um, with Amy's family, kind of the same thing. If we get everyone together, you know, it's still not that big a gathering because we really don't have a lot of relatives in the area. Some of you, however, when you gather with your family for a holiday, it's a packed house. Some of you have to get larger areas to gather with because you have so many family around you, and it extends out, right? You've got your immediate family, then your extended family, then your extended extended family, like, you know, second, third cousins, and then even further than that, that guy that comes, and you know you're related to him somehow, and he's super obnoxious, and he's always there, but you have no idea why. And you're kind of bummed when he shows up because he eats too much, but he's there with his kids and you can't tell him no because somehow he's family. You know what I'm talking about? See, now we're getting into what we would call a clan. Not your immediate family, not even your extended family, but family beyond that. For the Israelites, you had your family, your extended family. You had your clan. Then you had your tribe, the tri tribe of Judah. Remember, there are 12 tribes. And then you had the nation, so clan, what this is saying is that they're not you know, directly related, but they are related. Related enough that it becomes significant later in the story. The second thing we're told about this man is his character. So his clan, but also his character. He's described as being a worthy man. This word worthy can mean like mighty warrior. It's used to describe warriors in the Bible. But we don't see Boaz leading armies into defeating God's enemies, no, it also can mean uh, nobility of one's character, or as one writer put it, a real substantial man of character. That's Boaz. That's Boaz. But almost as abruptly as Boaz is introduced, the scene changes again. So we go from looking at the end of chapter one, Naomi and Ruth, they come back, barley harvest. Ding, 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 something important's about to happen. Then the scene shifts, new character. We recognize this character's gotta be important. But then almost when we start getting used to hearing about Boaz, it shifts back to Ruth and Naomi. Much like a dramatic movie, we'll introduce a character, but you know he's gonna come back and play a part, a significant part later on. Now we're back, though, looking at Ruth and Naomi, and Ruth exhibits her own strength of character. Look at what it says in verses 2 and 3. And Ruth, the Moabite, said to Naomi, let me go into the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she, Naomi, said to her, go, my daughter. 
What we see here is that Naomi is struggling. How could she not? She has lost her husband. She has lost her two sons. She's left with nothing. Other than this act of gleaning, there's really nothing she can do to earn an income. She is probably depressed, and she's almost paralyzed. And notice it says specifically, and Ruth, the Moabite, the foreigner, the one who is not a part of the people of God, is the one who says to Naomi, I'm going to go. See, Ruth must have been struggling herself. But Naomi is not doing anything to provide for herself. Ruth, instead, instead of sitting in her own misery, she decides to get up and is determined to do something to fulfill her promise to provide for and take care of Naomi. And so she set out to glean in the fields. Now, gleaning was the food stamp system of the time. It was the Oregon trail card of the ancient world. And we read about it in multiple places. And one of those places is Leviticus chapter 19, verse 9. That gives us a little glimpse into what this uh, act of gleaning looked like. It says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to the edge. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after the harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyards bare. Neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. So what is this talking about? Let me put up a couple pictures to help uh, explain it. This is how they would harvest back in the day. They would have, you know, sickles, those, those uh, kind of, you know, curved uh, knives, and they would grab a, a few stalks, and they'd cut it off, and they'd shove it under their, their arm, and then they'd grab another stalk and cut it off and shove it under their arm, and when they had, you know, enough that they couldn't carry it anymore, they would put it in a little pile, and then they would go on. But if you can imagine as you're, you're cutting, it's pretty inefficient. And sometimes you'd grab and cut and maybe you didn't grab a stalk hard enough and that stalk would get knocked over and it would just kind of be bent, but the, the barley would be still on the stalk. But you'd keep moving on. And, and sometimes when you're cutting, maybe the barley would fall off on the ground and you'd just leave it and you would carry on. Now behind the men who were harvesting would come women. And these women would gather those bundles and bind them. And then they would leave those and someone else would come and take those back to, uh, to the barn or wherever they were being stored. And so you had the harvesters and then there's kind of a gap and then you had the women coming behind them. And then behind the women, you would have those who were gleaning. And the gleaners would come and any barley that had fallen on the ground, any stalks that were knocked over but weren't fully cut off, they were able to take from. And as we see, saw in Leviticus chapter 19, you weren't supposed to, uh, to reap up to the very boundary of your field. You were to leave a little strip and other places it says the corners, just leave them there so that the gleaners could come and have something to provide for themselves. That is what it meant to glean. And Ruth set out to do this. And it was very risky business. She was a woman. She was a foreigner. She would be many times alone or in close vicinity to other people, but people she did not know. It was backbreaking work, difficult work, messy work. Imagine the sun beating down upon you as you're hunched over for hour after hour, gathering together these stalks of grain, every last little bit that you could find on the ground, because you knew every little bit you needed to provide for yourself and for your family. Now, the fields were not clearly marked, and Ruth didn't really know anyone anyway, and so she said, you know what, I'm going to go out and try to find a field where they will kind of leave me alone, where I'll find enough favor to, to go about my business. And it says in verse 3 that she set out and went and gleaned in a field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. Fields would kind of go into fields, into, into other fields, and she, she's gleaning along, and at just the right time, she happened to come into Boaz's field. And all of a sudden, we perk up and think, Boaz, I just heard that name. Where did I hear? Oh, yeah. He's the one who is in the clan of Elimelech. He's the worthy man. And she happens to come to his field. Do you believe in coincidences? The author here seems to be saying, yeah, what a you know, stroke of good luck. In fact, the Hebrew here says this, that she chance chanced upon the field of Boaz, emphasizing this idea of, of chance, of coincidence, but by saying it back to back the way he does, chance chanced, 
what he's saying is this really wasn't chance. There was something behind the scenes that was happening. It wasn't that it just so happened she came upon that field. No, she came upon that field at just the right time. Someone once said, a a coincidence is God wishing to remain anonymous. Well, God here doesn't really stay anonymous, does he? He's not mentioned by name, but the way the author is writing this is clear. Something here is, is going on. Something behind the scenes. And then it's even reinforced in verse four when it says, and behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. Whoa! Ruth's out there and she happens to come upon the right field. And then behold, when what to my wondering eyes did appear, but Boaz, the man of the clan of Elimelech, the worthy man, he came at just the right time. Imagine that. Proverbs 16.33 says, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Casting lots was, a, was an ancient way of making decisions if you didn't know what to do. It had to do with rocks or rocks that were formed in the little die, and you throw them down, and, and depending on what side they would land on, you would make a decision. It was kind of like the, the ancient way of doing a magic eight ball. Have you ever used one of those? You shake it up, and you know, a little message comes to the top. It's completely random what message is going to come to the top. You know, am I going to get this job? Not likely, right? And what this is saying is, yeah, it may seem like random chance, but it's every decision is from the Lord. He guides even the role of a die used to make an important decision. And so the narrator here is using hyperbole to show, no, this was not just chance. She didn't just chance chanced into the right field. And behold, he didn't happen to come at just the right time. Something is going on. And right away we see that Boaz is a worthy man, just as the author said. That's not an exaggeration at all. He deserves that reputation. Look what it says in verse four. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to his reapers, his servants, his workers, the Lord, Yahweh, be with you. And they answered back, the Lord bless you. And all of a sudden, we're facing a worthy man who greets his workers by calling on Yahweh to bless them. It seems that he cares a lot about his workers. And he cares that the Lord is involved in the act of of sowing and reaping and and being about the, the busyness of the day. And it seems like he has led his men in such a way that they now see this as well. And this is startling when we remember at what time the story takes place. Do you remember? The very first thing we're told about this entire story is that it takes place during the time of the judges. The judges, that horrible period of darkness in Israel's history that was marked by the statement, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Everyone, it seems, except Boaz, who as he comes into his field, says, Yahweh be with you. And his workers who say, the Lord bless you. And then we're introduced to the foreman of Boaz's workers. It says in verse 5, Then Boaz said to the young man who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? He's so in tune with what's going on on his fields that he recognizes there's, there's someone gleaning here that's never been here before. Who is that? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, verse 6, she is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. And so she came and has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Right there, the original readers would perk up and say, that's a strange request. Number one, it was was the right of, of foreigners to go glean. So just asking permission to glean, it wasn't needed. And secondarily, notice what she's asking about, that she may glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. Now remember what I'd said about reaping. You'd have the reapers who would, who would cut the grain and leave them in, in piles, and then you had women coming along behind who would bind them up into stalks, and those would be taken back. Well, she's asking to go behind the reapers, to gather among the piles. That is something that just was not done because the temptation would be to kind of take a little bit from the piles. 
the part that actually belonged to Boaz, the part that they weren't commanded to be able to take. And so she asked this, and she's gleaning, and we, we're kind of left with this suspense of why would she ask that, and, and what's the response going to be? It's almost as if you read what she asks, and, and then you hear the dun, dun, dun. But then look at Boaz's response. It's as much startling as Ruth's original request. Verse 8, then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, do not go out to to glean in another field or to leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessel and drink what the young men have drawn. And then she fell on her face and bowed to the ground and said, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I I'm a foreigner. Boaz, in this act, gave great protection and great provision for Ruth. Why did she have such a response? Didn't she ask to be able to to glean in these areas? But he goes beyond her request. And he says, not only can you glean where you want, but stay close to my young women. And then to everyone else, you'll, you'll just appear to be one of my workers. And I've told my men not to harass you. And in fact, if you get thirsty, you don't need to go find a well somewhere. Go to the water supply that is used to give water to my workers and drink there. And not only that, but the practice back then was was women always served water to men. If you read through the Old Testament, you see that. You see women who draw water for the men to drink. And foreigners would always draw water for Israelites. But did you see what he said? He said, drink what the young men have drawn. He tells Ruth, you know what? The the Israelite men are going to draw water for the foreign woman. What a blessing. What dignity is given to this woman. Daniel Block states it this way. Boaz has dignified this destitute widow from a foreign land and treated her as a significant person on par socially with his hired and presumably Israelite field workers. Ruth, who is obviously extremely self-conscious about her alien status, cannot believe Boaz's indifference to the fact that she is a Moabite. And that is why she falls to the ground. And she says, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Well, what's Boaz's response? But Boaz answered her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, how you left your father and your mother and your native land and came to a people you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. He knows who she is and what she has done. And that may have startled her, man, how would he know? Well, think about it like this. If, you, uh, if something happens here in Dallas, everybody in Dallas knows about it in about five minutes. Isn't that right? Small town syndrome. And we've got about 15,000 people here, right? What if you only had a couple thousand people? Or, in this case, what if you probably had a few hundred people making up the entire town. How fast will the word spread? And Boaz knew exactly who she was, exactly what she had done. As soon as she was introduced to him, he knew she's the one who has been taking care of Naomi. Then he invites her to come and dine with the other workers. This was never a right given to gleaners. They were to just be out and pick up the morsels. No, he says, not only are you to act like one of my workers, come and dine with my workers. And it says here in verse 14, at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come and eat some bread and dip your morsel into the wine. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed her roasted grain and she ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. This was a woman who was destitute, a widow who could not provide for herself, someone who had been traveling, you know, probably for a long time, weeks upon weeks to get back to uh, Bethlehem. When was the last time she was able to eat until she was filled and satisfied? And in fact, so satisfied she had some left over she was able to take back to Naomi. What grace, 
What provision, what protection did Boaz give her? And really what he is saying is you are now a part of the family. You are no longer just a foreign widow. You are now to be as if you were one of the Israelites working here. What an act of grace. And that's what Christmas is all about. See, we were the foreigners. We were the ones on the outside. We were the outcast. We were the marginalized, spiritually. And yet Jesus came to this earth. And Jesus came to bring peace on earth, not immediate peace between warring nations, but peace between God and his enemies. God and the foreigners, the outsiders. That is you and me. What Boaz does for Ruth, God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 17. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off, and peace to those who were near, the far off Gentiles, those who were not uh, the family of God, but also peace to those who were near the Jewish people. For through him we have both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Like Ruth, we have been brought in to the family. And he continues to bless her. Not only does he feed her and give her access to water and protection, but verse, verse 15, when she rose to glean, so after the meal, Boaz instructed his young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. Basically, let her go wherever she wants and, and don't touch her, don't reproach her, don't embarrass her. Let her take what she needs. And then he goes on to say in verse 16, and also pull out some from the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean and do not rebuke her. So she's to go along with the women, but the men who go before her as they're cutting it off, he says, you know what, just drop a little extra on the side. Make her job easier. Give her what she needs. What incredible provision. What incredible provision. And it says that she gleans until evening, verse 17, that she beats out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. Now, we don't know exactly how much an ephah is. There's been a lot of study looking at, at ancient measurements and things to try to figure out how much that is. Roughly speaking, the best guess is somewhere between 30 and 50 pounds of grain. Now, if, if she keeps this up, as it says that she does for the entire barley and wheat harvest, this would be enough to uh, sustain their family for just about the entire year. Boaz enables Ruth to fulfill her promise to Naomi to take care of her. And what a woman. What great strength to do that kind of work, to gather that kind of grain, to take care of Naomi in this way. And as she comes back, Naomi is amazed. Look at what it says in verse 19. And her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. If you were here last week, do you remember how Naomi was acting when she got home from the trip back from Moab? Don't call me Naomi, pleasant, beautiful. Call me Mara, bitter, because I left full and I've returned empty. Her faith was a wreck. But now, because of the actions of Ruth, what is she saying? Wow, may he be blessed by Yahweh. Her faith is being rekindled. And what's fascinating is the way she says it is, is a little uh, confusing. May he be blessed with the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. The statement of whose kindness, which person is it referring to, to Boaz or to Yahweh? We aren't actually sure. It could go either way. It could read like this. May he, Boaz, be blessed of the Lord. Boaz's kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Or it could read, may he, Boaz, be blessed of the Lord. The Lord's kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. It's not clear in the Hebrew grammar which one it's referring to. And so you have some scholars who will say one and some scholars say the other. I like, though, what one scholar said. He said the, the ambiguity may be intentional because it's through the kindness of God, 
or through the kindness of Boaz, that the kindness of God is given to this woman. Through Boaz's actions, the kindness of God are at work. Isn't that what we see? That God does extraordinary things by using ordinary people, living their ordinary lives in faithfulness to him. By Boaz doing these things, God is actually blessing this family. And so it is true that Boaz should be blessed of the Lord because both Boaz and the Lord's kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. How incredible is that? And think about it. Nothing that Boaz did really uh, on a grand scale is that remarkable. He was generous with this woman. But if it wasn't for this book, we would never even have heard about it. It would have been a kind act done thousands of years ago that would have been forgotten in the annals of human history. And yet, God uses this ordinary action to produce extraordinary effects so that we are sitting here thousands of years later in Dallas, Oregon, talking about the kindness of Boaz. How incredible. How incredible. And then we're told, not only should this man be blessed, but he's a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. Oh, yeah. Boaz is in the clan of Elimelech. They're relatives, and he's a redeemer. Next week, you're going to hear much more about this concept of the kinsman redeemer, the the idea that really themed this whole series and gave us the title of this series. But a kinsman redeemer, redeemer, in short, was a way that that, um, widows could be provided for. And many times, specifically with regards to ownership rights of land, women were not allowed to own land. It was the husbands that owned the land. So if the husband died and the widow really wasn't able to own it, and so you needed another man in your family to redeem the land in order to continue to provide for the widow and her family. But there's also another sense to this because if there is no heir then the kinsman redeemer can also, through marriage, provide an heir for the family, essentially bringing a family back to life. Without a husband, without sons, this family could have passed off into oblivion. No one would have ever known about them. The family line ended once and for all. But there's a redeemer. Is that the hope that Naomi and Ruth need? And that's how this chapter ends. Hopeful, but also tentative. Because look at what it says. Verse 23, so she kept close to the young women, Ruth did, the young woman of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and the wheat harvest. Seven to eight weeks later. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Could Boaz be the kinsman redeemer to redeem this family and give them hope and a future? Could he be the one? But eight weeks have passed and nothing's happened. She's still living with her mother-in-law. Is he really the kinsman redeemer? And this chapter ends in a sense of suspense. What's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? We'll come next week and find out. Or you can read ahead. But let's look now at each of these main characters because really, if we, if we say that God does extraordinary things through ordinary people living their ordinary lives in faithfulness to him, how do we see that come about in this story, and what does this have to do with us? First, we see the faithfulness of Ruth. The faithfulness of Ruth. She was faithful to her commitment to Naomi. Even when things were not going well, they make it home. Yes, it's in time for the barley harvest, but Naomi is a wreck not doing anything to provide for the family. Ruth has to take the initiative to go out and and do this work, to slave away, to try to provide for her lost and broken and old mother-in-law. And yet she is faithful to to that commitment no matter what. Naomi turns out to be bitter and depressed, but that does not deter Ruth from fulfilling her promise, being faithful to what she committed to, no matter how difficult the work And it makes me wonder, are we faithful in our commitments? Can others count on us? It may seem like a little thing to to fulfill a promise, to to keep a commitment. It may seem like just the thing you need to do and not really that big a deal. And yet, in Ruth's case, it became a great deal. Because through Ruth's commitment to Naomi, you see Naomi's faith start to be rekindled, reborn, 
She now sees that Yahweh is doing something in her life, in her family, once again. And if Ruth had not kept her commitment, Naomi never would have seen that. Do we keep our commitments? Do we allow our commitments and and how we keep them and be faithful to them to be something that helps do extraordinary things in this world or in the lives of others? Ruth did, and I think we should too. Ruth was also faithful in her work. It would have been easy for her to sit back and and wait on the so-called one true God to do something to provide on their behalf. You know, okay, Naomi, your people, my people, I'm going to live where you live, I'll die where you die, your God will be my God. Okay, so that God promised a bunch of stuff, I'm waiting for my ship to come in. Isn't that how a lot of people who claim to be Christians think? Man, okay, I'm going to commit my life to Jesus and I'm going to sit back and wait for the blessings to roll. And then when the blessings don't roll like we want it to, we get discouraged and walk away. How many times do you have you known people who have walked away from the faith because they feel like God has not blessed them in the way that God should have? But see, Ruth doesn't sit back and just wait for blessings to come. She goes out and does something about it. She puts into action her faith in God's promises. And God is able to use her work to provide for the family to fulfill his own promise to them. So are you willing to to work hard because you know what? Your faith is going to be difficult. Living the Christian life is difficult. It is not easy. It takes work. But when we're faithful to our work, God is able to do some incredible things. Gleaning is a pretty normal, ordinary grunt work stuff. And yet look at what God started doing because Ruth was faithful to go out and work. What about the faithfulness of Boaz? He was faithful, first of all, to to lead honorably. His reputation was a worthy man, a man of noble character, and we see that in how he's introduced, calling down a blessing on his workers from the Lord, bringing their attention to the fact that as they work, the Lord is watching over them. And clearly he has led them well because they reply, the Lord bless you. Morale seems to be high. They seem to have great respect and admiration of Boaz, their boss, their leader. Do you lead in such a way that point others to the Lord? Do you lead in such a way that those under you thrive? Do you lead in such a way as to cause those under you to admire and respect you and your character? And through you, Do they begin to admire and respect the Lord that you serve? That's what happened with Boaz. And then secondly, Boaz was faithful to live graciously. To live graciously. He didn't just treat his workers well, the Israelites. He didn't just treat men well, but he treated this foreign woman with incredible grace, with with sacrifice, to the point where he was giving extra grain to her that, that wasn't deserved of gleaners. That was never commanded in the law. And yet he went to those lengths to give graciously and sacrificially and to provide not just a, the provision she needed, but also the protection that she needed. Proverbs 14.31 says, Whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors him. Boaz honored the Lord by how he was gracious with Ruth. Do you treat those who society marginalizes with dignity, respect, care, and grace? That's what we're called to do. Because we were once the marginalized. We were the outsiders. And through Jesus, we were made to be part of the family. And so how Jesus treated us, we are called to treat those around us. That means those who you would not naturally go and hang out with or provide for or give or, or sacrifice for, we are called to do that because that's what Jesus did for us. And how we treat them is a reflection on how we view our Heavenly Father. Now to our third main character. No, it's not Naomi. We're talking about the faithfulness of Yahweh, of the one true God. God was faithful to provide provision and protection for this family. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9 says, The heart of the man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Have you noticed how in this story, each person's kind of going about their business, and yet through it all, God works out his perfect plan in just the right way at just the right time? 
Just look how God provided for Naomi and Ruth. They returned to Bethlehem just as the barley harvest was beginning. Remember, it's only a span of of seven to eight weeks. If they had come in the middle of that, they wouldn't have had enough food. Not only do they come just at the beginning of barley harvest, Ruth comes to Boaz's field. Not only does she come to his field, she comes to his field and is currently gleaning there when Boaz arrives from Bethlehem. And God uses that relationship to provide food and safety for Ruth and Naomi. And not just food and safety, but further redemption that we're going to talk about in a moment. So let me ask you, do you believe that God's going to protect you? Do you believe that? If you say yes, well, how can we tell? Do you take risks for the sake of the gospel? Are you willing to do that which would appear to be unsafe? That may even appear to be unwise for the sake of the gospel because you trust that God is the one who's going to protect you. Do you believe that God will provide for you? Or are you constantly stressed and anxious, wondering where the next paycheck is going to come from, or where you're going to be able to buy food from, or, or how you're going to be able to provide for your kids? Do you believe God is the one who's going to provide for you? Because God will always do what is best for you. He will not always give you what you want, but he will always give you what you need, and he will give you what is best, guaranteed. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Ruth believed it enough to go and work hard and look at what God did as a result. God provides protection and provision to his people. God is faithful to provide redemption. Redemption. Spoiler alert, Boaz is the kinsman redeemer. So in case you were wondering, I'm sorry, but that's the end of the story. He is the kinsman redeemer. He's not just qualified to be. He becomes the kinsman redeemer. And through Boaz, the family of Elimelech, which was dead, no future, no hope. The family was going to die out. Now gets reborn, redeemed. Not only that, but through this family comes King David, who becomes the solution for the problem of the judges. There was no king, and so everyone did what was right in his own eyes. But David comes because of the kinsman redeemer Boaz. And not just that, but through the line of David, we have Jesus the Messiah who comes, born in Bethlehem of the line of David, a.k.a. the line of Boaz and Elimelech. And so not only does this family get redeemed in the short term, this family gets redeemed for all eternity because on David's throne is an eternal king, King Jesus, who will rule for eternity, everlasting to everlasting, from death to eternal life. Sound familiar? That's the story of Ruth, but that's also the story of us. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is, but the gift of God is eternal life. Death to eternal life. So that's the story of Ruth. Death to life, that's the story of Christmas. Death to life, it's the story of Jesus. Death to life, that's the story of you and me. Death to life, that is an extraordinary story. But look at all the ordinary, run-of-the-mill, regular life things that have to happen for this extraordinary thing to take place. And therefore, we conclude that God does extraordinary things using ordinary people living their ordinary lives and faithfulness to him. I'm going to invite the ushers forward and the worship team to come as we pray. God, I thank you so much for who you are, for what you've done, for for how you have blessed us, Lord, in Jesus, but also how you blessed us in the story of Ruth through which the story of Jesus was able to take place. God, you are our Redeemer through Christ. You have purchased us back through the blood of Jesus. We have been redeemed from death to eternal life. And God, we worship and praise you because of that. We thank you, Lord. We pray that we would not forget that this Christmas, that through all the the celebrations and the lights and the, the presents and the food and all these things, Lord, that we would remember that Jesus is our kinsman Redeemer. And that is why we celebrate. We pray all of this in his name. Amen.